Okay, so my title is Preventing Cyber Terrorism, the Criminalization of Preparatory Activities. And my starting point in this paper is criminalization theory. Theories of criminalization attempt to describe when resort to the criminal sanction can be justified. So when should we prescribe something as a crime? And a recurring theme in the different accounts is the idea of criminal law as last resort. So we only use the criminal law if it is the least intrusive, appropriate response. And this is based on two things in particular. Firstly, the severe intrusion on individual liberty that follows a criminal conviction. And secondly, the criminal law's high degree of moral censure. And what first interested me, that drew me to this topic, is what seems like a contrast between criminalisation theories, criminal law as last resort, and counter-terrorism strategies which insist that terrorists should be prosecuted wherever possible. The reason that counter-terrorism strategies say prosecution as first resort, there's several reasons. Some are more security-based. There's the fact that a criminal conviction gives the state access to severe sentencing powers. It gives the state access to the stigmatizing label terrorist. But there are also due process reasons. It gives the suspect the opportunity to respond to the case against him, and it requires the state to prove its case in open court beyond reasonable doubt. So the desire to prosecute where possible is both understandable and appropriate. But it does generate a pressure to use the criminal law with less restraint. This can result in broad criminal offences which stretch the boundaries of the criminal law. And it's this temptation to expand the criminal law that I want to focus upon in this presentation. Now picking up the theme of football again, in spite of last night's events, I've divided the presentation into two halves. The first half looks at uh, what might be described as broad conceptions of cyber terrorism, different forms of terrorist online activity, and the second half looks at narrower conceptions of cyber terrorism, uh, terrorist cyber attack. So beginning with online terrorist activities. So, so far during the conference we've already mentioned a number of different ways in which terrorists use the internet. Uh, recruitment, propaganda, planning, communication, training and fundraising being some. And there are numerous crimes which are available to prosecute such activity. So I've put a few on the slide, that was all I could fit on. This is just an indicative list. So you see some there from the 2000 Terrorism Act in the UK, fundraising for terrorist purposes, use or possession of money or other property for terrorist purposes, collecting information or possessing a document likely to be useful to a terrorist. And then a few from the more recent 2006 Act, encouragement of terrorism, dissemination of terrorist publications, preparation of terrorist acts, training for terrorism, and attendance at a place used for terrorist training. Those are all from UK legislation, but if you go to other common law jurisdictions, you'll find similar offences. And the label I'm going to use as a shorthand for this category of crimes is precursor offences. So just to clarify what I mean by that, the slide shows a simple timeline. So the culmination of the timeline is the feared terrorist attack and that could be prosecuted as a murder, or as a hijack, or criminal damage, or other relevant offence. A step back in time then, you have the law of criminal attempts. So in the UK, that would apply to acts which are more than merely preparatory. 
In the US, it would apply where the defendant has taken a substantial step towards commission of the crime. Precursor crimes apply one step further back, so before the defendant has actually gone beyond mere preparation. Actions such as collecting information, possessing an item, or undertaking training would all be examples of this kind of mere preparation. So precursor crimes expand the scope of the criminal law in this respect. They also expand the scope of the criminal law in a second respect, and that's by encompassing a wider range of actors. Individuals can potentially be convicted of a precursor crime, even though they lack any direct involvement in the planned attack. They may only have some associative role or some facilitative role. So, for example, someone who indirectly encourages someone else to instigate a third person to commit an attack could be prosecuted for a precursor crime. So they expand the criminal law in these two respects, and the question I'd like to ask is whether this type of expansion can be justified. So I'm going to use what's generally regarded as the leading account of criminalisation, the harm principle. The harm principle says that only harmful wrongdoing may justifiably be criminalised. And the harm principle is generally regarded as an important constraint on the state's, the state's use of the criminal sanction. So conduct can only be criminalised first if it's wrongful, and then even wrongful conduct may only be criminalised if it causes harm. So the harm principle insists that immorality itself is not a sufficient ground for criminalisation. And if you think back to the list of precursor crimes I just showed you, it's readily apparent that those crimes cover much conduct that's not in itself harmful. Many preparatory acts are ones that ordinary citizens do regularly, looking at a train timetable, buying an air ticket, even reading information on the internet about bomb making does not in itself cause anyone harm. Terrorist propaganda on the internet may cause offence, but a distinction is normally drawn between offence and harm. So this presents a challenge for the harm principle. Because if we're seriously going to say that actions can only be criminalised if they cause harm, then it's likely that many people will reject the harm principle as being too restrictive and, frankly, irrelevant. We shouldn't have to wait for the harm to actually occur. Well, this challenge has been addressed in an important recent book by Andrew Simester and Andreas von Hirsch. And they categorise examples like the ones I just gave as examples of remote harms. Remote harms. Remote in the sense that some further action is required, either by the defendant or a third party, some further action is required before any harm will actually result. And they argue that remote harms can justifiably be criminalised as long as the individual had some normative involvement in the feared eventual attack. And they define normative involvement as, in some sense, affirming or underwriting the intervening actor's subsequent choice. So that provides us with a justification for criminalising remote harms. But the normative involvement argument also entails two constraints. Firstly, the crime definition should require some conduct that is capable of being regarded as wrongful. 
And secondly, the crime definition should also require some proof of a mental state that is in some way directed towards the feared eventual harm. And it's these two constraints that present problems for some of the terrorism precursor crimes. So, a couple of examples. The first one, the offence of preparation of terrorist acts. A person commits this crime if they engage in any conduct with an intention to commit a terrorist act. Well, that clearly encompasses conduct that is inherently innocent. I was at another conference where this point was discussed quite a lot, and the example that was used to illustrate this became known as the Muesli example. So a would-be terrorist decides that he's going to commit a terrorist act, but he feels that he needs to lose some weight first. So he decides to go on a diet. First day of the diet, instead of having his normal fry up, he has a bowl of muesli. When he eats the muesli, he engages in conduct. And he does so with intention to commit a terrorist act in the future. Well, eating muesli is inherently innocent conduct. To label the act of that defendant in that example a crime is very hard to reconcile with the nature of the criminal law as a moral condemnatory institution. The criminal law is about conveying blame. And it's arguable that it's inappropriate to seek to blame someone when their conduct is inherently innocent. So this is an example of a precursor crime that violates the first of the two constraints I outlined. Second example, this is the offence of possessing a document likely to be useful to a terrorist. To be convicted of this crime, first of all, you must be in possession of a document that calls for an explanation. But the only required mental element is that you know you have possession of the document and you know the nature of the document's contents. In other words, no terrorism-related mental element has to be shown. And this led to a counter-intuitive outcome in a case called R against G. The defendant in R against G was a paranoid schizophrenic. He was in custody for non-terrorism offences. As a result of his condition, he was convinced that the prison guards were whispering through his cell door during the night. So he decided to try and get his own back on them. So to antagonise them, he somehow, and I don't know how, somehow acquired information on explosives. And then he left it in his cell for his guards to find. The guards found it. He was, convict he was convicted of this crime. The case reached the House of Lords. The House of Lords upheld the conviction. He had a document that called for an explanation. It was information on explosives. It's not something that people ordinarily possess. He knew he had possession of the document. He knew the nature of the document's contents. And the case actually centred on the defence of reasonable excuse. But the House of Lords said, trying to wind up your prison guards is not a reasonable excuse. So he was convicted of a serious terrorism offence, even though he had no involvement in terrorism, and no such involvement was even alleged. So that looks like a violation of the second of the two constraints I outlined. OK, so before we move on to the second half of the presentation, what we've seen so far is that you can construct a harm-based justification for terrorism precursor crimes. But the harm principle does impose certain constraints, and existing offences do sometimes exceed these constraints. <coughs> 
But it's important to point out at this stage that compliance with the harm principle is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for criminalisation. In other words, just because a crime complies with the harm principle doesn't automatically follow that the offence should be enacted. There may be very good reasons for not creating an offence, even though it does comply with the harm principle. So once you have an offence which satisfies the harm principle, you then need to assess the arguments for and against enacting it. Some of the things you might take into account are the gravity of the feared harm, which in terrorism cases is particularly relevant, the probability of it occurring, and then also some counter concerns, the importance of treating individuals as autonomous moral agents who are capable of choosing, and in particular choosing to desist from their terrorist intentions, and the possibility of intrusive policing investigations to try and prove a terrorist purpose. Well, in the UK, Parliament, when weighing up these different concerns, has tended to attach most weight to the desire to prevent and the uh, concern to intervene at an early stage. Now, I don't want to revisit this, I'm happy to assume that the desire to prevent events like 9-11 and 7-7 is sufficient to outweigh the concerns about precursor crimes, as long as those two constraints I mentioned are respected. My question is whether the balancing exercise changes once you start talking about cyber attacks. Should the full range of terror precursor offences still be available when what you're concerned to prevent is a cyber terrorist attack. And this is important uh, for the reasons Kieran explained yesterday. The definition of terrorism contains section 1, subsection 2e, which makes all those terrorism precursor offences available in cases of a feared cyber attack. So is that really appropriate? Well, just as an analytical aid, I've got four examples here. Some of them people have already used during the conference. So in all of these, I'm assuming that you have the, the ism, the terrorist motive. So you have a group that interferes with air traffic control, causing two aircraft to collide. This is from Bar Barry Collins. You have someone that interferes with a serial Manufacturer changing levels of iron supplement, which leads to fatalities. Then you have a group that targets the country's economy. It attacks the stock exchange, it sends the national economy into chaos, and it causes enormous economic damage. And then you have an example like one that Kieran mentioned yesterday, a DDRS attack against a government website meaning that the server can't function properly and the website's unavailable for a few days. All of those fall within section 1, 2 E. So in all of those examples, the full range of precursor crimes would be available. Well, I'd really just like to make three points. First is, of those four examples, we are only concerned with numbers 3 and 4. And that's because numbers one and two already fall within other paragraphs within section one, two. The first example is covered by paragraph A, serious violence against people. And second example would be covered by paragraphs C and E, covering endangering life, risk to public health and safety. So when we're asking whether precursor offences should be available in cases of cyber attack, it's examples three and four we're concerned with because those are the cases where paragraph E is making the precursor crimes available when they would not otherwise be. Second claim which may be contentious 
we're assuming, we're agreeing with Parliament, that in examples one and two, the threat and the potential harm is sufficiently grave to justify the existence of precursor crimes. I think it's possible to argue that the potential harm in example three is also sufficiently grave to justify access to those precursor crimes. Although it doesn't cause physical violence, such a large-scale attack on a country's economy could affect millions of people, cause significant loss and hardship, and generate widespread fear and anxiety about the attacker's future targets. So the preventative rationale that's so potent in the first two examples, in my opinion, is arguably similarly important in example three. But then third point, we need to make a distinction between examples three and four. In example four, the argument for having access to the precursor crimes is much weaker because the potential harm is far less grave. And given that lesser degree of harm, the autonomy and the policing objections to precursor crimes should, I think, take precedence. Now, that's not to deny the importance of prevention, but remember that you have the ordinary inchoate crimes like attempts, like conspiracy, like incitement, which would still be available in a case like example four. So those crimes do still serve the preventative function. Well, if you agree with me on those three points, I think the upshot is that the definition of terrorism that we have at the moment needs to be refined. To the extent that it covers cases like example four, it's over-inclusive. As well as the precursor crimes, the definition also makes available a wide range of special policing powers and procedures that really can't be justified in a case like example four. And this could be straightforwardly rectified by enacting proposals like the ones that Kieran and George Williams have advanced. There's also a broader point, and this uh, goes back to Andy's paper, and in my opinion, uh, confirms that he's correct to be sceptical about the what is cyber terrorism approach to definition. The approach I've taken seeks to ask why we have the definition, what purpose it serves, and we need to work that out first before we decide on the scope of the definition. So the definition really is an output of that evaluation. It's not some kind of ontological inquiry where we're trying to describe some objective object. So to finish off, I think it's worth just saying a brief word about why this discussion is important. Precursor crimes have an important impact on how affected individuals perceive the fairness of the criminal law. In this brief presentation, we've seen that at the moment, individuals can potentially be convicted of serious terrorism offences carrying severe maximum sentences First, without any requirement to prove normative involvement in the feared eventual attack. And second, where the attack itself may not even properly be regarded as terrorist. Now, some respond to that by saying we can rely on prosecutorial discretion. But in my opinion, that merely makes things worse. It implies that whether or not someone violates these offences is actually relatively unimportant in deciding whether to prosecute them. The decision to prosecute on that argument seems to be based more on national security considerations that are not actually an issue at the trial, which the defendant therefore has no chance to try and rebut. And that has an impact then on how those individuals perceive the fairness of the trial. So, counter-terrorism strategies insist on prosecution as first resort, in part because of the moral authority and the legitimacy of the criminal law. But terrorism precursor crimes have the potential to undermine the very reasons why we insist on prosecution in the first place.
Thank you.